بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم Welcome to a weekly discussion. I'm Sabia Kamali. I'm Sultana Begum. We'll be discussing some of the news that have made some of the headlines this week in the show today. Um, our main topic today is the current um, situation and the ethnic cleansing in Rohingya. So Sultana, what do you think of the situation in Rohingya at the moment? Yeah, because I was quite sort of um, quite shocked by some of the things that's been happening. Um, I know that we've been we were discussing a lot of the things um, before the show um, in terms of what the situation is in Rohingya. Um, as Do you think the um, the Western <coughs> countries and the world in general has turned a blind eye? Um, it seems like it almost feels like as in the the situation in Rohingya is that they're being persecuted by mm. the Burmese government. Um, and Bangladesh has closed its border as well, and the people seem quite trapped um, mm -hmm. where they are. Um, I, I mean, currently a huge number of Muslims have been killed, and many have um, been fleed away. This situation mm -hmm. isn't something new. It's been over six decades, and it's yeah. a long time. And for the world not to react, it's, it's, isn't that quite bizarre? Yeah, because I, I mean, I'm. It's at the moment. I mean, it seems like at least it's made it to the media. Mm -hmm. I think I was looking around for some of the stories before. I know that you and I both were looking into it, and it's it's been like another uh, BBC World Service was talking about Human Rights Watch has done a lot of work um, and tried to publicise um, the the cause, um, and it just seems like almost it's quite sad. It feels like the people have been kind of forgotten. Do you think because the world doesn't benefit or it's more of a political situation and economically it's something that it doesn't benefit people so that's why the topic hasn't been highlighted as much? Because what has happened in Rohingya, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean the thought of it right, sort of brings mm. tears in your eyes, just the whole situation and the barbaricness yeah. of it people being slashed yeah. and it's all due to the fact that mm. they're Muslims yeah. and the fact that um, being Muslim and it's not being highlighted on the mainstream media for them not being killed. I mean anything that is Muslim terrorism it's always the front page but this is when Muslims get attacked and by Buddhists they must be mu are the most peaceful pe loving people. Um, yeah because it's I don't know it's sort of like um, it's quite a difficult situation. I know the Burmese government, uh, they're saying something along the line that they're actually accusing the people of burning their own homes down. And I know that Human Rights Watch, that they were talking mm -hmm. a lot about it and they're saying that no, the people are being persecuted. Um, and because they've cordoned it off so that a lot of um, international press, international aid can't get in. So no one really knows what's going on. I mean, what, what is the situation? What is going on? I mean, I think... Um, Many have been, like, don't, they don't even have the citizens, do they? They don't even have rights. Right to vote, yeah. I so know, and the fact that they've been there, the family have been there for generation after generation, and the fact that they've got no rights yeah. in itself, that yeah. is quite concerning. Yes, yeah, so it's almost like there are people because um, you're, I guess, if you think about it, when you vo by voting, by being mm. a citizen, you sort of are a participant of that society. Yeah. So if you're sort of like separated off and you're not even allowed um, to become part of the mainstream society and you're just sort of left, then literally they have no right to vote. Literally they don't have a say. I know, I mean, for me, I think I'm still trying to get over the fact that they get him killed in the country and all the neighboring country are mm. closing the border so what happens to these people they're not wanted doesn't matter where they go mm. they're not wanted they're not wanted in the country of birth they've been they had their livelihood there yeah. they're not they're not wanted in that country neighboring country are not taking in enough refugees so what happens to these people where do they go why is the world turned a blind eye I don't know, for me that's like quite, I mean, I'm reading what it says here, it says Bangladesh has summoned the ambassador of My Myanmar to express, which is Burma, to mm -hmm. express deep concern at the military operation that has forced thousands of minority Rohingya Muslims to flee border villages. It's, uh, it says that Bangladesh has stepped up border patrols and sent many Rohingya people back and it says thousands of it says despite our border guards, uh, thousands have been reported to be crossing the border because they're desperate. I mean, I, mean be I know this yeah. isn't a new thing, but back 
in the past, Bangladesh had accepted a mm. lot of people, and a lot of people have taken refugees in places like Chittagong and mm. places like that. So um, I guess Bangladesh in itself, it's a third world country, and the fact that its resource isn't as much, and until I think the Western UN countries, if they don't do something, it's more of a political situation than, I mean, I know there are aid agencies out there trying to provide aid, but at this moment, aid isn't the main concern. The main concern is safety, and the safety can only be assured by UN, wouldn't you say? No, I, no, I, I agree with what you're saying. As, mm. I mean, everything that you said is completely correct. Yeah. I agree with you. I think um, what the situation now is, it's almost like no one is willing to take responsibility for these people. According, I mean, like, according to Burma, um, they are citizens of Bangladesh. For Bangladesh, they're not, they're, they don't accept them as being, because they've been living in uh, Burma yeah. for thousands of years. So technically, who, who, which country do they belong to? And it's really sad that because, I mean, they're almost trapped. But they've yeah, been in the, living there for a long time and nobody wants to claim them, you know, and you're talking about children, you're talking about families and I just, I find it... I mean, the yeah. most bizarre thing is most of these people are getting killed based on their religion because they're Muslim. It's got nothing else to... Do you think it, so? Do you it think is, that's what it is. It is a racial tension because every article I've read in Guardian, mm -hmm. every newspaper, mm -hmm. they've mentioned the fact that it was an ethnic cleansing and it's origin. this recent one started off with a Muslim guy was accused of raping a Burmese girl. Okay. But then when they followed up the story, yeah. it wasn't true, it was all made up. And it wasn't covered by their national mainstream newspapers and mm -hmm. TV. It was a local news and after that, people were being killed and it became a uh, internal fight between, because before that they used to live peacefully, but then saying that, it's been ongoing for over six decades. So it's been a long time that it's been happening and it's taken this long mm to actually hit the media and even then it's not the main story it's a story that you have to search for mm. and that is that is concerning for me yeah because it's I mean, it's, um, according to the BBC, which I'm reading, it said some Rohingya who have arrived in Bangladesh say women are being raped men are being killed homes are being burned in and it goes so Burma is denying this and it's the thing is no one can go in there to, to verify what's going on and mm -hmm. that's I just feel in this day and age you know with the fact I mean like we've it's just quite shocking that this is happening and you know like there I mean I don't know how do you feel about this what's your feeling I think it's quite sad um, living in the Western country that we're not doing much to raise concern I mean the main issue at the moment is their safety which isn't assured by any country and no no even not even Muslim countries are taking them on board as well so for me personally I think the fact that kids are being killed kids are houses being burnt women are being raped and if the whole Western world turns a blind eye then is there any humanity left within us yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, I mean, I know that human rights groups are calling on the government, uh, according mm -hmm. to the article I'm reading, um, to ensure that AIDS can at least reach um, yeah. the Rakhine state. And they were saying that access to about 50,000 vulnerable people are being, is being restricted. So then, he, I mean, it does ask, you ask that question, if a government is not allowing the media or not allowing aid companies to, you know, convoys to come in to that mm -hmm. state, the cordoning off, it actually begs the question, what is really going on? What are they hiding? Of course. And this is like, you talk about Burma is like a Buddhist state. I mean, I'm not trying to say that people who are Buddhist are necessarily, you know, peaceful, but it's, it's just... I guess they do yeah. preach peace like any other mm -hmm. religion, like Islam and any other religion, every religion, the ethos of every religion is peace, love. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have extremists in every religion, I don't think Buddhists are any separate. I think that they're like every other religion. They have their level of extremism as well. But to see to this extent, it's horrendous from mm. my understanding. It's just kind of like, you know, when you think of um, on San Suki, she's, too, she was, she's a Nobel laureate, right? She yeah. received uh, for human rights uh, work that she d she has done. So it's the fact that she's quiet as well on this issue. I'm not well, trying to... that, I remember yeah. a couple a while back, she mm -hmm. came on BBC and she was interviewed by a Muslim uh -huh. woman and she raised concerns. She didn't like the fact that she was interviewed by a Muslim mm -hmm. person. So I think that... Really? Why, yeah. What did she say? Like I think she did raise concern that why she been interviewed by a Muslim presenter. So that in itself just sort of shows what kind of person she is. Even 
though they say they're from a democratic party and it's all about democracy, what mm -hmm. kind of democracy is her party preaching? That's the kind of thing that I would like to know as well because mm -hmm. you can't turn a blind eye. It's a big thing. Like people are being killed in your country. Yeah. That's quite sad because I know that, that she's been fighting for justice mm -hmm. and for um, human rights in our own country for a long time and, and she's internationally happened. recognized. This has been happened for the last, what, 60 years? It's yeah. a long time. Way yeah. before she was in Pearl, now that she is mm -hmm. in, things are You, you would have hoped things worse. would be different, right? Yeah. But then I guess it shows you, um, it's that whole kind of Orwellian kind of idea that or people who fight for justice necessarily when they do get freedom, not necessarily the case that they'll always be the best people to... I know. I think the whole situation mm. in Rohingya at the moment, it's still the same. Yeah. So um, let's see what happens. Let's hope yeah. for the best. Let's hope mo 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 some of these countries will open their borders and mm. take in more refuge. Um, shall we move on to our next story, yeah. which is more <coughs> at home? Yeah, the so the next, yeah, the next um, one is the autumn, autumn statement. The autumn statement. What do what you think? Um, I think this is the first financial mm -hmm. um, paper that came out after the Brexit, so I think everything in here will be quite slightly different, yeah. new, because before, before the Brexit, it was different, wasn't it? We were part of the EU, and now that we won't be, yeah. I think they will need a lot of help in where to get the money and how to, and where to yeah. borrow it from. Because it's quite interesting, I think, um, I know that it was all over the news today, and mm -hmm. it's, there's been a lot of... Uh, well, it was issued today, after half twelve, so obviously yeah, it's the yeah. most... Thing, important thing at the moment. I mean, they, I know they're talking about jam. Yeah. Um, what does it mean for you? Oh, I guess they're talking about families um, that are in that income bracket mm -hmm. between, I think they earn between 12 and 40k before tax. Yeah. And they're saying that these are the families that are struggling in the UK today, financially struggling. So you're talking about homes, you're talking about just generally it's trying silly, to isn't get it? We're, away. we're part of this, one of the riches country in the world and yet we have people living under poverty and the whole when I was reading around the whole jam it felt like it was people who had a choice between do they pay for or use the electricity mm -hmm. or is it the people who go pay for shopping so if we live in the world's yeah. richest country and the fact that we have to have a choice between this or that the both essential needs the both like we need so the fact that they're only catering from that it's kind of disturbing to think that mm -hmm. do we have people that, on mm -hmm. that level what do you think, like, I mean, in terms of Bangladeshi community, would you say there's a lot of people that are falling into that just about managing category? Jam? Of course, of course they do, because there are a lot of families, because Bangladeshi families generally, ha mm. we have, like, more kids, well, income, and, like, yeah. and the income isn't always the greatest because mm. of the way the whole thing works out. Mm. We, most of us live under the poverty line. Yeah. And the fact that something like that will affect the family, because if you've got five mouth to feed, and then you've got electricity, and then you just think, how do I budget myself? Yeah. Mm. So I, th I personally believe it would affect mm. the Bangladeshi community yes. a lot. Most definitely. And I think one of the things they were saying is that the government is borrowing a lot more. Um, I think I was sort of watching, I was reading one of the reports, it was saying that when they came in, they were, bor up, they were borrowing, they had a debt of a one, tri one trillion and it's mm -hmm. actually going to uh, triple. And you say that because the Chancellor did say he's mm. trying to offer more to the British society, but if that's yeah. the case, how is he going to offer? By borrowing money, how are you going to offer more? Yeah, because I think they're saying that the, the deficit's getting bigger and bigger, um, the gap, and it's kind of like interesting because if you look at what they've done is, I was looking at some of the things and they were saying how they'll be raising the upper level tax um, mm -hmm. cutoff point, you know, at, uh, where it's at 40k, from 40k onwards you get taxed at the higher rate. Yeah. So they said they're going to move the from move it from 40k to 50k okay. and they're going to also um, bring the threshold, you know, from when income becomes taxable. So at the moment, I think it's just over 10K, we're just under 11K. Mm -hmm. So they're going to move it to 12.5K. So the idea is that people can, um, so the idea is that it's supposed to help people on lower incomes. But then at the same time, um, I mean, I don't know, like some people, some of the commentators were arguing, saying by them taking it from the, f why are they taking money from the poor and they're giving it to the rich in this mm -hmm. sense? They're moving it from the 40 to the 50K bracket. But these are yeah. people that are already earning quite a bit of money. Um, and I was just going to say the same yeah. thing because 40 to 50k is a huge jump but from mm. just under 11 mm. till 12 it's not exactly a jump is it so the yeah. fact that it's going to affect it's always a case though it's the people on low income are, mm. um, are the ones who are affected the most yeah 
because they said they're going to freeze. I mean, some of the things they were saying is they're going to freeze um, the the benefit, the universal credit that people receive. So they're talking about people that are on working tax credit, mm -hmm. people that um, receiving other kinds of benefits to support them, working mm -hmm. families. But they're because they're struggling so much, you know, they they they, they receive other benefits to top it off. So what they're saying is they're going to freeze that. So that means people are going to be less uh, well off. I mean, I know result. the president said today. Sorry, the prime minister. She said today that she wants a country that works for all including the poor the rich do you think with this new autumn statement it would work for all um i don't know there's different arguments isn't mm -hmm. there like some are saying um that it's actually and some are saying it's 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 they're welcoming it saying that some of the things that they're doing is i think they were saying they're going to build 1.4 billion um for for 40, for 40 000 affordable homes yeah. um i think somewhere it was also saying right to buy pilot for housing association tenants, which might be because a lot of people that mm -hmm. are interested in buying the council home or the housing association, but because they live in housing associations, they can't buy them. Yeah. And so that means that some people will be able to do that. And I think there's other things that they'll be bringing in. I mean, it might be worthwhile to sort of see, I mean, it might be worthwhile for people to read to see how it benefits them in any way. Um, and I think they also said, um, um, what is it? Benefits. Yeah. So some of the things has been positive, but some of the things I'm not quite sure. I think like what? Um, it's just the fact that um, you know, like some of there hasn't been. Like I think one of the things I think some people are mentioning is that there needs to be the NHS needs more funding, uh, social care needs more funding. Yeah. So there's a, we're going to come across. Uh, so we're going to talk about an article later on, which is looking at uh, the way elderly people are taken care of in our society. And I think one of the th articles I was reading, they were hoping that the autumn uh, report will highlight the fact that there's more funding needed for elderly care because they're the most vulnerable people in our society. Awesome. And I think one of the things is it's totally disregarded. It hasn't sort of raised anything about that, even though it's been in the media. It's been uh, discussed for the last few weeks. Um, but so things like there, there's, yeah, so... I guess with the autumn statement, because it came out today, um, there's a lot to take in, mm. and I think there's a lot of things still to go. But with the whole taking more, um, taking a loan and going about it, it'll be still. I mean, I mean, I personally think whichever way it goes, it should have a positive impact impact on the society as a whole. I mean, that's what they're hoping for. However, with something like that, it always always affects the people like who are on the low end, mm. who are on income support, who are on some kind of benefit. So I don't know how this autumn statement will mm. work for mm. the low income, because I know it works in the benefit of the people who are earning quite a bit, because if their tax has, if they got away with another 10K, that's like a huge money. How many, mm. how, how many Bengali households mm. are on that kind of yeah. wages to think about mm. it? They did say like they're gonna increase the living wage, so they're mm -hmm. gonna move it, I think they've increased it from Thirty-fifty, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's gone up a little yeah, bit. Seven fifty, I think. Yeah, seven fifty. Yes. Which is going to be quite. Which a bit they, helpful. which is roughly about a five hundred pound mm -hmm. more end of the year. So yeah. that's for the so income, which isn't bad. I'm thinking, how is it like you know for people that are sort of receiving, but then they're taking away from people on benefits. So if they're going to sort of, they're, they're increasing the living wage, mm -hmm. which is good. But then at the same time, for people, struggling families, because you're talking about ordinary people yeah. who are receiving um, uh, who are receiving universal credit. If they're freezing that and they've actually reduced it, so then they're giving in one hand, but they're taking away with another hand, and it just makes me feel like families are the people that really need that money. I know. So if you're a single person yeah. on your minimum wage, I'm not trying to say your single people need less money than no, of um, course not. Well, it, no, it is true though. Family yeah. need more. You've got yeah. kids to feed. They've got demands. Mm. They're growing up. They need things. As a single person, mm. you you're only looking after for yourself. Yeah. So the demand isn't as much. But with the whole universal credit, I think when it came in, it mm. was affecting the poor people. And mm. the fact that now that from 500, it's gone down to 250 or 350, it's even more concerning because like Bengali households have big family, they have more kids. Mm. And I think that affected Bengalis in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that all Bengalis are like <coughs> under the poverty line, but I think I don't know, it's quite, quite massive. Yeah. I think our community is really struggling. I think generally we fall into the low income brackets mm -hmm. compared to Indian, Chinese and other communities. We do yeah. fall into the low income bracket. And I just feel like um, all the things that I think they said they were going to do, like, you know, Theresa May was saying a few months back yeah. that they were going to do more to support families into, the, you know, there's 
into that middle bracket of families that are struggling, right? Yeah. And it just feels like they haven't done enough. Um, there's a lot more they could I think have until done. they don't create proper jobs for people to do, mm. and, they, and instead of blaming the foreigners coming and taking the job, instead of bl play, playing the blame game, I think yeah. if they created more jobs, that should help the situation. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to move on to yeah. the next article about Tony Blair, who wants to come back. I know he says something along the line of Tony Blair brands Corby a nutter as he lines as he lines up for shock to return to politics. What do you think, Tony Blair coming back again? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, mean, I know with Tony uh, Blair, for me, he reminds me of my uni tuition. He reminds me of the Iraq war. He I think for me, it's all the negative things. But I know Tony Blair generally has been good for the country as well, besides his negative. But for me, I think we've gone over that stage. T what Tony Blair took the country down, what line? I think I don't. I don't think I want to revisit that again. What would you say? Do you? Because Tony Blair thinks um, Corbyn is a nutter, like um, it said in the Express. And um, a lightweight, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. So he doesn't think they have it in them. So what do you think? Do you think we need Tony Blair back? No, I hope not. <laughs> He's awful. Didn't he get like completely crucified by the Chill Court inquiry about his involvement in the war in Iraq? Of course. And he was, um, you know, he was forced to sort of like eat his word almost mm -hmm. um, in terms of going to war. He almost apologised, did entirely, but he yeah. everyone, there's a collective understanding that he's he made some major mistakes. So how can you even come back from that? And I know that there's been a lot of uh, discussions in the media. Mm -hmm. Some people still feel like, oh, Tony Blair, they see him as a strong figure, that yeah. the Labour Party is not the same since. Yeah, but, but he fabricated the truth. Yeah. He, well, not only fabricated, he made, like yeah, he made up a lot of yeah. stuff and he denied a lot. So I don't know. Do you, I know personally, I don't. Mm. I don't know about you. I don't know if he's good for the country because after... He misled us into Iraq do you think war. He, do you think he has a chance of coming back? Do you think the Labour Party would want him back? It's hard to tell because uh, even though we have Corbyn who is on the left, you still have a huge um, within the Labour Party who are on the right and who would want people like Tony Blair because it's people like Tony Blair that serves the right within Labour Party because under Tony Blair, Labour Party didn't feel like Labour, it felt more Tory policy, yeah. it felt more of a conservative government, didn't yeah. it? And to be honest, I think where since Tony Blair has left, um, there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of people who a lot of Blair rights or people who are centre right or whatever you want to say, mm -hmm. they've um, struggled to kind of get, get into leadership position. I mean, David, um, th th there's been a lot of like yeah. controversy around that thing, and I think some people feel that maybe Tony Blair is, I don't know, they need someone like that and they need him back. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> then, then I think, but then if you think about it, if the Labour Party elected someone like Jeremy Corbyn, who's very much on the left. Mm -hmm. And that's the majority of the members. Why would they then select, I mean, Tony Blair? And how, what role would, could he possibly pay, play in this? I, I don't understand why he even made those comments. He said he didn't, by the way. He said he didn't call him an utter. Oh, he didn't? Yeah, apparently, he said that he did So didn't. on the Express, who did the Express quote then? Cause I don't know. It was like the headline, much. wasn't it, yeah. on the Express? Like they said that apparently, but he's saying he didn't personally. Apparently, mm -hmm. he said it to someone else who quoted that. But apparently. <laughs> Apparently, just to be on the safe yeah. side. Well, the thought of having him yeah. is a nightmare. And I think I like the fact that Corbyn is in and the party is moving to the left and the fact that the party is serving mm. the people and the interests and is looking after the poor and is anti-war. I think Corbyn says a lot of things that I actually see him as a good leader. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, but I, what I don't understand is, like, obviously the Labour Party generally has lost um, a lot of votes this time. I mean, they, if you look at Scotland, Im they voted in the SNP, who are even more left than the mainstream Labour Party, right? So if the country's already moving a little bit to the left, mm -hmm. um, I just wonder why do people, why there's this understanding that we need someone like Tony Blair to come back in somehow it's going to sort the country out. I just kind of I know we've got the Tory government yes and a lot of people are saying that we need we need some we need kind of like the Blairite thinking to bring the country back you know mm -hmm. into the middle and that Jeremy Corbyn could not win an election but I just that's silly because under Jeremy Corbyn there were, there were like he, there was a by-election yeah. then they had an internal thing and they they've been having quite a few election even though the party wasn't happy with him as the leader they still had people voted didn't they yeah yeah so what would you think? What do you no. think about Tressa? Uh, okay, so um, 
Okay, <laughs> what we're going to do, I'm going to put you on hold now. We're going to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned.